Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. Who gets to be considered an expert is a conversation that's been going on in journalism for as long as I've been in the game. And I imagine it's something that gets discussed in a bunch of other fields, but particularly science. The subject comes up today in this interview with Jessica Hernandez, a Maya Chorty and Zapotec environmental scientist who wrote a book called Fresh Banana Leaves, Healing Indigenous Landscapes Through Indigenous Science. And she talks to here now Celeste Headley about how often indigenous people are looked over in conversations about climate change. And Celeste asks her what she wishes she knew when she first began her career in environmental sciences as an indigenous person. And she says she didn't think it'd be a constant battle, as if fighting climate change wasn't hard enough. As we look for solutions to climate change, the insights and lived experiences of Indigenous people are often overlooked. That's the argument in a new book called Fresh Banana Leaves, Healing Indigenous Landscapes Through Indigenous Science. Its author is Jessica Hernandez, a University of Washington postdoctoral fellow from the Mayor Chorty and Zapotec Nations, and she joins us now. It's so great to have you here, Jessica. Baguchi, thank you for having me here today. So you write, quote, While in Western academia, we are always in competition with one another as indigenous scientists, we collaborate because we know we are ultimately stronger together. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, so one of the things about like being an indigenous scientist is that we understand the impacts colonialism has and continues to have on our people. And also, like you were mentioning, the climate change impacts that is, you know, exacerbating our community disparities. And as indigenous scientists, we work together to collaborate on ways that we can find solutions that will holistically heal our planet as well as our people as well. And you also write that the environmental discourse has failed and continues to fail in uplifting and centering indigenous people's voices, perspectives, and lived experiences. What is missing from the conversation about the environment? I think some of the things that are missing from the conversation about our environment is that indigenous peoples are experts, oftentimes in environmental sciences or in any of the disciplines. We continue to view indigenous peoples as areas of expertise or research subjects, whereas, you know, indigenous peoples hold on to the knowledge that can holistically protect our environments, especially as we continue to see how climate change impacts are drastically shifting our weather patterns, our climate impacts, and seeing how we can address more justice solutions in that sense. Tell me the story of the title. It's Fresh Banana Leaves. What is the story behind that? Yeah, so that story is grounded on my father's experience as a child soldier during the Central American Civil War. They started, you know, using violent tactics to kind of recruit children as well. And most of the children that were recruited were indigenous children. And my father was, you know, fortunately forced to join the guerrilla when he was 11. Mm -hmm. And during that time frame, there was a banana tree in his guerrilla encampment that he would kind of frequent, that he would talk to, that he would climb to kind of serve as a sanctuary to escape the harsh realities. You know, three years passed getting his training, being in his encampment. When he was 14, his guerrilla encampment was bombarded. And one of the first instincts that he decided to do was to go under this banana tree that he had built a reciprocal relationship with and consider, you know, his friend and relative. And he saw a bomb drop on the tree and instead of the you know the bomb igniting the leaves kind of wrap themselves to prevent the bomb from igniting so my father says right that as as long as we protect nature nature will protect us you spent a lot of your younger years in south central los angeles though and you you live in seattle now uh, and you mentioned in the book that 70 percent of native peoples reside in urban environments and yet many indigenous people think of cities as inherently non-indigenous spaces. Why is that? We forget that in these cities, you know, there are indigenous communities that are considered, you know, urban communities now because their environments have gone through these drastic changes. When we talk about Seattle, we can even talk about the history of how it was named after Chief Seattle. 
you know, a Duwamish tribal leader and how the Duwamish tribe is still fighting to kind of get federal recognition. So I think that because we tend to always connect indigenous peoples to more rural places, we forget that urban cities are also built on indigenous lands. And that goes, you know, throughout the United States when we talk about Berkeley, California, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and these major cities that hold political and economic power in our country. So you are an indigenous woman in the sciences, uh, the first indigenous person to teach intro to climate change at the University of Washington. Have you had to deal with, say, patronizing or condescending views when you start to talk about indigenous science? Yes. And I think that, you know, fortunately for us, the narrative is starting to shift. But oftentimes, right, we we are asked, how is this science? How is, you know, where's the data, the numerical data to support these claims? And I think that for indigenous ways of knowing, not everything is translated into numerical data sets. Not everything is published in, you know, the peer review process. And I think that oftentimes because in sciences, we still continue to exclude lived experiences or personal narratives. It kind of continues to invalidate communities and ways of knowing that are, you know, centered on storytelling, that are centered on lived experiences, that are centered in our traditions that are not necessarily, right, normalized in what we consider today the American society. So you are also female, and there's a chapter in your book called Tierra Madre, Indigenous Women and Ecofeminism. How does patriarchal history and systems and misogyny, how does that make it more difficult to make change when it comes to climate change or or even uh, the indigenous women who are working towards helping the environment or moving science forward? Yeah, so one of the ways is that we continue to remain invisible, right? Like I even, in the book, I talk about the Zapatistas movement and how the Zapatista movement, which kind of reclaimed land for many Maya communities in southern Mexico, continues to paint the man, Comandante Marcos, as the leader, when in reality it was the indigenous women who were the leaders who were leading the communities to kind of, you know, reclaim their lands. And I think that oftentimes when we talk about environmental justice or climate justice, is the men in our communities that are continue to give, you know, the front and center and the leadership of those movements when in reality is indigenous women who are leading those efforts. And I think that with patriarchy, right, there's also the missing and murdered indigenous woman, you know, epidemic that's impacting all of us across the Americas from Canada all the way to South America. And I think that with that, when you are an indigenous woman advocating for the protection of our mother earth, you're going to, you know, face more violence. Yeah. Now, according to the National Science Foundation, as of 2017, at least, about 70 percent of doctoral degrees in sciences were awarded to white people and less than half a percent rewarded to indigenous students. It can't be easy to be an indigenous student in the field. What do you wish you had known when you first began studying? I think one of the things that I wish I would have known is that, you know, there was going to be a constant battle, especially when going, you know, when talking about Western sciences, when trying to bring in my entire self, because I think that one of the premises of our indigenous knowledge is that it centers our spirituality. But in the Western sciences, right, in the name of objectivity, we have to remove ourselves from the science that we practice Can you give me an example of one indigenous practice that you feel like should be more widespread, that that more people should, should use? One of the, you know, indigenous practices that I think people should use is like our milpas, which are these holistic agricultural ecosystems that, you know, are very different from Western agriculture that tends to focus more on just one crop through, you know, monocultural societies. And I think that with the milpas, it kind of embodies the three sisters as we consider them in the southwest region of the United States, where we plant our corn, our beans and our squash. And because they're relatives and they kind of take care of one another, they grow faster. It doesn't require as much as human labor as Western agricultural practices. And through Al Milpas, we're able to also have that intergenerational teaching where, you know, our elders are teaching our youth and everyone participates. And it's like a communal harvest where, you know, we are taught to take what we need and not necessarily what what we want to take more of a holistic agricultural practice that we should follow, especially as we're seeing how, you know, everything is interconnected. So we're seeing how agricultural is also leading to more climate change impacts that, you know, are drastically impacting all of us now. 
So you talk about the importance of cooking with banana trees, fruit and leaves in Oaxacan and Salvadoran communities. I wonder if you have a food recommendation. Can you recommend a dish to try? I would say um, platano frito. So that's like fried plantains. And I think that they're really oh. good. You can pair them with beans, eggs. And I think that that's what I'm always missing from, you know, when I'm away from my parents, because something about like the way that my mom cooks it is very delicious. So that's the dish I will recommend people to try. <laughs> you can eat those alone. You don't need to put anything with them. <laughs> they are delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Hernandez is a University of Washington postdoctoral fellow from the Maya Chorti and Zapotec Nations. Her book is called Fresh Banana Leaves, Healing Indigenous Landscapes Through Indigenous Science. Jessica, thank you so much. Padushi, thank you for having me here today.